Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 136, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. And this show coming out just before the final bank holiday weekend of the year here in the UK. And it's going to be 2019 in four months' time. That blows my mind. It's absolutely crazy. You know, since we've been doing this podcast, we've kind of been keeping an eye on all the charts and stuff. And... With all your help, all you fantastic listeners, we managed to make it to the top spot of the tech news charts on iTunes. Number one in the iTunes podcast tech chart last week. That deserves a little round of applause for our amazing audience, doesn't it? Uh, and it's probably no coincidence that it came the week after our nightmare panel that we recorded from Play Expo. So um, it does mean, I mean, I don't know if you know the way the iTunes chart works, but essentially it counts new listeners, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's new listeners. And... This is really good because it's like put us above people like the BBC World Service, and Tech Wired. 10 and Wired and even the Apple podcast. Yeah. So this is just absolutely fantastic. I'm amazed with the response of this one. And even, you know, forgetting the fact that we host this show and all that, the fact that a retro gaming podcast can take the title of number one in the iTunes tech shop for two days, I think we were last yeah, week, yeah. is like just... It's a sign of how big retro gaming is right now, I think. so. Definitely, and the fact that we did an event in the capital. So we'd like to thank Replay Events so much because that was just such an awesome event, Play Expo, and we've got more awesomeness to bring you from Play Expo as well today. Now, we do have another panel that we are going to bring you. Um, a guy that actually we've tried to get on the show for quite a while. Um, since we're doing Play Expo, we said, let's two birds, one stone. We're recording for the podcast as well because um, he doesn't do a lot of interviews anymore, actually, this guy. But he was behind some of the most infamous games of the Commodore 64 and the Spectrum and the Amiga. We're talking Archer McLean. Well, he was huge. I remember seeing him on uh, Games Master. Yeah. And, he, and, he, and he came on Games Master and he'd always do kind of promotion. And you know what? Everyone kind of thought, a snooker game, that's going to be really boring. But actually, it was really good fun because of the whole physics of the game and just like the snooker balls would give little faces, you know, when they were bored and stuff. It was really good. But that was we, Jimmy White's World Win Snooker, wasn't yeah, it, the game yeah. you're talking about? Which you're right, I think before that, all snooker games I found really dull. Yeah, totally. <laughs> like, And also the backgrounds of them and the kind of environment would be pretty boring. But this excited the whole thing. And it was 3D as well. Yeah. Running on like an Atari ST or an Amiga 500. And the fact that it could do that and like, how quick was like the, the 68K CPU? 7 megahertz? Oh, absolutely <laughs> crazy. Really, really good engine. And also International Karate, that was just a phenomenon. That whole game, my whole youth was spent kind of trying to bounce balls off shields and pulling, not, your, pulling your mate's pants down yeah and knock people's <laughs> pants off exactly but Archer I mean he's a really interesting guy I mean his background is kind of more in electronics and that's actually what he's doing today I mean he's also I don't know if you we didn't know this before we did the panel with him he's like one of the UK's biggest collectors of digital watches and calculators oh, and, and, and gaming machines. cabs as well yeah. he, he's got an original space war and an original Pong machine, which is like, wow, they must be so rare nowadays. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's got like a very early serial number of one of the original yellow Pong cabinets. And like like you said, how many of them are in the world today? Such an interesting guy. We're going to bring you our panel with Archie McLean, recorded live at Play Expo in London a couple of weeks ago. That'll be coming up on the Retro Hour podcast in around 15 minutes from now. Now, we do say every week, the reason that we keep doing this show and can bring you a weekly retro gaming podcast and also to get to number one in the iTunes tech charts, which uh, still blows our mind. <laughs> yeah. uh, but also, the fact that we can keep bringing out the podcast every Friday and getting you amazing guests is thanks to your support as well. Now, however you do that, there are loads of ways to support this podcast. It could be leaving a nice little review on your favourite podcast service. It could be sharing us on your social media getting your friends involved as well if they're into retro gaming. I do love that when we post an episode on like Facebook or something and people go through and tag all the mates, like, you've got to check this show out. Yeah, or even if you have any kind of guest suggestions, you can come and join us on Discord and let us know because we've got an everlasting list. It's just growing and growing and growing. So, Well, I was up till about three in the morning last night um, rendering a Blu-ray video. I don't know if you've ever rendered a Blu-ray movie. No, no, disc. no. It kind of reminds me of, do you remember when you first got a CD burner on your computer like back in the late 90s? And it was like one speed. <laughs> yeah, and it'd take like 40 minutes to burn an audio CD, wouldn't it? And you couldn't do anything else on your computer. Your mouse would lock up and all that. Kind of reminded me a bit of that. It took about an hour to burn this like um, 15 gigabytes um, Blu-ray disc on my drive. But while it was on, I was on my laptop 
laptop just chatting on Discord with like some of our audience. So, so many cool people in there as well. And it's, it's very active now these days, our Discord channel, isn't it? Yeah, totally. So if you do want to join that, I mean, we do have links to it on uh, the front page of our website, theretrohour.com. And another way you can support the show as well is by leaving a little donation into our tip jar. Because, um, you know, doing a weekly podcast, it does have a lot of costs involved as well. So anything we get into our tip jar all goes back into the running of the show and essentially means that Ravi and I don't have to pay for the whole thing about our own pockets. And just for making a donation of any amount, you will find your place in the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. And that guarantees you a shout on a future episode of the show. Just like this week, thank you to Roy Gelotti, Carl Kuras, Paul Edwards, and Norman Davy, who all made donations into the running of the show. Uh, you can do the same as well by PayPal or cryptocurrency, if that's your thing. You'll find those links on the front page of theretrohour.com. Now, before we bring you our panel recorded at Play Expo a couple of weeks ago with Archer McLean, let's talk about a few stories that have been making the headlines this week. Now, do you remember when the SNES Mini came out? One of the big grumbles was, it only comes with like a certain amount of games. You can't play your originals on it. You can't put ROMs on it. Yeah, that, that's changed though now, hasn't that, it? That, that has changed. Yeah. Now there's a device here uh, which is just coming out, which is called the Classic to Magic attachment, and basically this is a little unit that you add onto your SNES Mini, and it has the ability to read old school carts. Okay, so original cartridges. Original cartridges, but it also has a USB thumb drive in there, so you can load ROMs. Now you've got to modify the. The NAS a little, uh, the SNES a little bit. That soft you, mod, is it? Yeah, you've got to do a firmware mod yeah. on there to get this running. So it's not like a pick up and play thing. But I still think it's quite a cool kind of accessory. And you know they're getting rarer and rarer, like old SNESs are. So actually having the ability to play a cartridge on there is pretty cool. I love the fact as well that the the attachment is actually bigger than the SNES Mini. Yeah, it is bigger <laughs> than the SNES Mini, and they've done it in that kind of SNES style as well, like the uh, plastic matches it. Yeah, the great plastic stuff, yeah. And it is cool. I mean, there is something very satisfying about plugging in a cartridge, which you don't get with these mini consoles quite a lot. I mean, I think it is going to be quite a, a niche audience. Uh, probably someone who's got an original SNES as well, but might want to take this around the mates and they want to put extra games on it, which I think, I mean, it does look like a simpler way to mod it than some of the solutions I've seen online. And the fact that you can plug a USB in as well, I imagine means you can have a lot more on there than you could with the internal storage. Yeah, they're saying, you know, you can play backups and yeah. uh, you've kind of got uh, a limited customization for advanced users. So I can imagine you can do some absolutely mad stuff. Um, but they're saying, you know, uh, uh, some game ROMs for other systems are supported via extra emulators, okay. which is interesting. So they're talking about how Vex Vectrex stuff's supported, Game Boy Advance, Atari 2600. Uh, N64 and stuff, so maybe this could open up a whole world of these kind of mini mini adapter things, you know. It would be cool if they got like a Mega Drive emulator running on there, wouldn't it? Yeah, That would yeah. be like a childhood dream to all come true, both running on one system. Uh, I do think it's awesome, though. Um, anything like this, you know, it, it kind of appeals to our nostalgia of having the original cartridges and plugging them in. I mean, it, it is a feeling that you can't really you know, replicate with emulation and that, can you really? Yeah, and uh, I know people, you can buy a probably cheap snares and just do this yourself, but if you've got the mini already, why not? The only problem is finding the ROMs after we, uh, we're we talking about last <laughs> yeah, week, Yeah, that's, that's going to be hard. Thanks to Nintendo. Uh, cool ROM. <laughs> that's the only site left at the moment. All right, we'll actually. see if it's still up next week <laughs> now you've said it. <laughs> so another story that's um, caught my attention this week. Do you remember watching The Matrix when you were a kid? How cool was that banana Nokia phone? Oh, they were so cool. And I remember when they came out, like, everyone called it the banana phone, but yeah. it was kind of black, wasn't it? Uh, they, they, I think they had a yellow version, but it was, like, black, the Matrix one. Yeah. Was. And, you know, that bottom, did you have to kind of, like, slam it on something to close it? I don't think so. Didn't it just pull down? <laughs> I, I'm sure it, like, flipped down, and then yeah. you'd have to bash it on something to kind of get it going again. That was the Nokia 8810. Uh, now, I never really saw one of these in person back in the day. Um, but I do remember seeing them in the Matrix movie and thinking, wow, that looks really cool. Because it did look so futuristic, didn't it, back in the late 90s? Yeah, well, uh, we used to hang around in phone shops a lot. That was the kind of thing that you'd do yeah. as, a, as a young Asian teenager, hang around the phone <laughs> shops. And people would have banana phones. And I remember this guy just showing it me for the first time. And he was a seat guy. 
and they uh, never cut their hair. So he, he got a hair trapped inside the banana phone and then handed it to me. <laughs> and I was like, uh, could you take your hair out before I buy it, mate? But, Free hair included. Yeah. <laughs> but it was awesome because it had the upgraded snake games from what I remember on there as well. Yeah, because that was, was it later than like the 3310? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was a bit later. And uh, then they had that awful Nokia one that had that jog wheel on it, if you remember, that was kind of a midpoint. It was a bit chunky. The first Nokia I got was, um, I did get a 3310, but then I got, remember their first camera phone? Was it like the 7250 or something? They all had weird numbers, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember my mate got one of those from Japan off eBay. Um, when eBay was quite early, and then I saw one, I had to get one as well. It cost me about 400 quid, I think I saved up for the, it. These were crazy expensive yeah. because everyone would bring them in from America yeah, just to have the banana phone. So so why are we talking about the banana phone anyway? Well, it's back. It's back. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, Nokia obviously did kind of do that re-release version of the uh, 3210, didn't they? Um, last year, was it, that came out? Yeah, I think they also did the 8810, which is like the really tiny one. Yeah, kind of upgraded. I mean, it's not an exact clone of the original. Oh, not, not the 8810, sorry, that's this one. But they, they, they had a smaller version The 8250 well. or something, wasn't it? Yeah. I get lost with all these numbers. <laughs> that's all the word. They weren't very memorable names. Yeah. Um, but recently, they've kind of been re-releasing... Well, it's kind of not an exact re-release because it doesn't look exactly like the original. It's kind of loosely based on the design principles of it, but with kind of more modern features as well. So, I mean, they're essentially what, what they name feature phones these days, aren't they? So it means that you will get a web browser on there. You'll get apps as well. You can run Facebook on it. It's got 4G. Yeah, 4, 4G internet on there too. But also, um, what I think a lot of people are liking about this is that it does keep that form factor of the original 8810 banana phone, as it was nicknamed. But also it's got a physical keypad on there as well. But do you know how long the battery life is for this? 25 days, I just Yeah, <laughs> 25 <laughs> days. I can't even last a day with my iPhone without charging it. Yeah, so, you get 25 <laughs> hours on an iPhone. So they're still keeping that old school Nokia. I remember I left my phone in my mate's car and then rang it two weeks later and it was still yeah. <laughs> with the old Nokia. That's the thing, I mean, it's... We, I think we kind of forget just how how long phones used to last before they got all the features that are loaded into modern phones. So that's the one thing. Battery technology hasn't really improved at the same rate as smartphone technology, has it really, in terms of the stuff no, they just, pack into No, they're it. complete resource hogs yeah. at the moment. So this, this, I could imagine this could be useful for someone who's probably on site all the time, like working at festivals or events or yeah. a builder or something like this, you know? I think there definitely is a market, and I mean, I don't know if you saw recently, BlackBerry have come out with a new handset as well. It's also got a physical keypad. Oh, wow. A lot of people have been like, oh, wow. I mean, I've got completely used to touchscreens, but I still I still do find typing on them for any length of time a bit of a pain. Yeah. And I could actually, because I mean, looking at this, it's got the old Nokia keypad, you know, where you, you press the number one like three times for a C and all that. And I'd have to retrain my brain a bit, but I have used one of those recently. It does come back to you pretty quick, that old predictive text way of doing it. So it is cool just to see Nokia handsets coming back out. I mean, they're never going to be what they were. Back no, in the no. Day. And there was a documentary recently, I think it was on uh, the BBC a couple of months ago. It was all about the rise and fall of Nokia. It's on iPlayer, probably still on there if you haven't seen it. Definitely worth a watch because, I mean, they were such an iconic company. Well, there's they? this uh, great video of, you know, on YouTube of them showing kids uh, kind of old phones and yeah. like, the first mobile ones. And they're like, Motorola. They can't even pronounce it and they're like Ericsson what is Ericsson <laughs> <laughs> who's Eric and why are we talking about his son <laughs> so uh, yeah I mean if, if you have got any nostalgia for it I think a lot of people will buy it just because oh yeah it's a phone I always wanted from the Matrix but like you said I mean it's only 70 quid this handset yeah. for something to leave in your car if, or... if you have a job where you're on call and yeah. you have to go to a building or something you just leave that in a drawer at your house and if it rings then you've got to run out or something you know but you can leave that on for 24 days I could just imagine someone walking into a building site in Monday morning, all right, lads, you remember banana yeah. phone? Like, what? <laughs> so if you want to find out more, and maybe audio yours, uh, it actually came out this week, so we'll put that and the rest of the stories we talk about in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, I do talk about the Nintendo Switch quite a bit on this podcast. I mean, obviously, it's a modern system, but there are a lot of classic games and kind of remakes of old-school games that come out on the Switch. And I do remember, you know, we talked about that uh, Mega Drive collection mm. that came out recently on the PS4 and the Xbox One and the PC. I was a bit gutted that that didn't come out on the Switch. Uh, but they did promise, you know, back at the start of the year, there are going to be some games released on the Switch. And now they're starting to release them. Now, these are classic Sega games that they're bringing out on the Switch exclusively as part of their Sega Ages line. But the thing is, they're actually doing some big upgrades to them as well. 
So rather than just being like, you know, an emulator or kind of upscale graphics, they're doing stuff like putting new features in old games, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, that's, that's really good. Now, do you remember, obviously, the Fantasy Star series was really big. Yeah, it was um, huge, wasn't it? RPG. Yeah. yeah. And the original, I mean, that came out on the Master System in 1987, they're going to be re-releasing that on the Switch as part of this uh, Sega Ages series. But back in the day, you had to have, like, graph paper by your system and kind of map out <laughs> what you're doing. But now they've actually integrated that into the games. It kind of tracks where you're going, and uh, it can list all the magic and items as well, rather than having to remember it. I mean, who sits by the console with a pad and paper these days? Not many people do. So, I mean, the, the good thing about it is you can turn these features off if you want to get, like, you know, back to the old school way of doing it. But also, they're going to be re-releasing the original Sonic the Hedgehog, but they've got stuff like the spin dash mode from Sonic 2 in there as well. Oh, cool. And they're putting in the drop dash from Sonic Mania into Sonic 1 Ah, because they did that with Sonic Jam on the Sega Saturn, and they redid the older versions and added in, like, spin dash and stuff. So yeah. it's cool to see that happening, because I can imagine, you know, a lot of people play these older Sonic titles and think it... Wait, where's the spin dash? Yeah, you feel <laughs> like, it wasn't in yeah. there, don't you? Yeah, I, I do. It blows my mind when I play it. I'm like, yeah, you can't do it in this one. Uh, but they're also putting Mega Play in as well, which I hadn't heard of. Mega Play was apparently a version which was really difficult that was used in the Japanese arcades of Sonic the Hedgehog. So they're going to cool. be putting that into these yeah, Switch re release a bit too. So I do think it is pretty cool that they are kind of getting the code and modifying it and putting these new features in. Yeah, they're not just pumping them out and going, right, we're just re-releasing these games for the Switch. There you go. You know, they're putting some effort into it, and that that's good. And, you know, it totally makes sense for Sega to do this because all their old franchises, they're just going to instantly make money out of them. And we talked about it last week. I mean, I must have bought Sonic the Hedgehog 1 about 50 times on yeah. different systems. I have no desire to buy it again. But the fact that they're doing something different with it makes me look at it and think, actually, I wouldn't and mind And also, they've version. got a huge base with Sonic Mania now. Yeah. All the guys playing that on the Switch will be thinking, oh, yeah, you know, how can I explore this world further? Well, my little nephew, Harry, he's like, what, five years old now? And he loves Sonic Mania. And obviously, he doesn't know the original game. To him, yeah, it's a new yeah. game. Yeah. So having this, this would be like a new video game to him and yeah. experiencing Sonic 1 for the first time, which is pretty crazy. I do think it's maybe a bit overpriced. They're charging $10 per game. So yeah. some people yeah, are yeah, I, I, I've seen, I've seen, you know, a lot on the Wii U and Nintendo store that's really expensive. That yeah. I, I don't think they should be that, that high. Yeah, for the titles, but you know, yeah, $10 for a Master System game is pushing it a little yeah. bit. I mean, I think if it was five, it'd kind of be like, you know, four ninety nine instant buy then. Wouldn't have to think about it, impulse buy. But um, maybe they'll come down. But maybe. It is cool that they're doing something different with it, definitely. Now, you were a big fan of your um, strategy games back in the day. Did you play The Settlers, though? Yeah, I, I kind of didn't really get time on Settlers. I was more into uh, Civilization and all the real-time strategy stuff that came out. There's only so many hours in the day to play those games. That's why yeah. they take a while, don't they? But it was a massive franchise, wasn't it, The Settlers? I mean, when did the first game come out? 93, I think it was? Yeah, and it was all kind of procedurally generated and, uh, you know, it was uh, Peter Molyneux's big game and fantastic art as well. Re really high-end concept. Like, if, if if I'd known about it at the time, yeah, I, I would have played it, but I was probably playing Syndicate. <laughs> so, but, I mean, that's the thing, you had to pump a lot of hours into those games to get the yeah, most out of them, yeah. didn't you? And that was, I mean, you had a village, you had to mine for minerals, conquering lands and that kind of stuff too. Very big game that a lot of people are very fond of. And a franchise that went for a long time, I mean, there's seven games came out in the series. Yeah, because there's so many versions, isn't there? And there was, like, PC versions, and I even remember there was... Uh, like clones of it as well. I think Foundations was one, which was kind of based on Settlers. It was the original out on the Amiga, wasn't it? Yeah, First yeah. First Settlers game, I do remember that. Well, I, I mean, think at Atari as well. Yeah, well, I mean, it's 25 years since the original game came out. So this year, Ubisoft are actually doing a 25th year anniversary Settlers release. So you'll essentially get all the classic seven Settlers games. They call it the Settlers History Collection in one bundle. So this is the good thing as well because they're, they're talking about the team being the Ubisoft Blue Byte team. Yeah. And I always remember Blue Byte being associated with Settlers and Ubisoft at the moment have a bit of a bad reputation when it comes to kind of bringing stuff forward. So I hope that this, this kind of team really does it well. Well, it's going to be coming out in November. They've actually got a little trailer up at the moment that I will put in our show notes. I mean, the cover of the trailer 
caught my eye straight away. It's like uh, they got their characters from the settlers walking across a real life Amiga 500. Oh, nice. So uh, they've obviously put a lot of care and attention into it. So I do love the fact that I mean, we, we seem to be talking about it so much recently that all our favorite games are suddenly like 25 years old, 30 yeah. years old. It's like we're getting old. <laughs> yeah, we're getting old. So uh, if you want to find out more about that, I'll shove that in the show notes too. Now, before we get into our interview with Archie McLean, um, I don't think we've talked about fax machines on this podcast before. No, we've not talked about fax machines. And they're kind of a thing that everybody forgets about. There's, yeah. there's a fax machine sat in the office, but also a lot of people have bought these all-in-one printers. And these all-in-one printers contain fax. Yeah. Faxilim, fax, facsimile machines. Yeah, I, 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 can, I can never say that. <laughs> facsimile. Yeah, that's it. Well, recently, um, at DEF CON, which is a huge uh, security conference and kind of hacking conference. Yeah. Uh, there's a group called Checkpoint, and they look at like exploding, f- exploiting flaws in kind of old technology and uh, you know uh, stuff that's been abandoned. Well, there's uh, kind of tens of millions of fax capable devices globally enabled, and uh, they've managed to find some vulnerabilities within them, especially HP OfficeJet Pro okay. all-in-one faxes. And uh, they're kind of... They've crafted a file that can be sent to affect the device, and it will cause a, a stack or static buffer overflow, which can allow remote, con- tr- uh, remote code execution. So what are they going to do, though, when they hack your fax machine? <laughs> well, that's the thing. Now... They're saying that they can send this file to the hack, uh, fax machine and then execute malicious code on top of it yeah. so they'll be able to take over fax, print out loads of stuff. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, Waste all your paper. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they're saying, you know, the NHS in the UK uses 9,000 already mm. regularly and stuff. But they're saying uh, there's 17 billion faxes sent uh, worldwide a year still. Oh, still, okay. Still, yeah. which is absolutely crazy. Now... It's it's kind of interesting that they found this in this odd device, but it's not really practical because if they're going to have to find these devices with this vulnerability, they're going to have to ring every ta- fax yeah. machine and that's going to cost an incredible amount of money. Well, that, they probably have ways around that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <I'd imagine>. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's that's the thing. It's, it is cool to find a vulnerability. And you're right. I mean, pretty much every office I've ever worked in, you know, the place I work now, we do have a dusty old fax machine in the corner of the office that might ring once every six months and was like, what's that? Yeah, <laughs> totally. Around. Like, a lot of people forget that all these systems are still running. They're still on there. Like, Telnet's still going on your PC. There's still, like, yeah. a lot of stuff that's kind of obsolete and uh, people could uh, exploit in the future, I think. And it's interesting to see this. Uh, I could imagine officers with all the fax machines firing up after years and everyone going, <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> this dust all splitting yeah. Again, I'm, I'm trying to think, what can they do? I mean, is it, is it dangerous? I mean, I suppose if they took over your fax machine and they were faxing other companies on your behalf... Like messages that you didn't want to get out there, maybe there could be a way that they could exploit it. Or just there. someone could like scan their bum and just do a mass, <laughs> <laughs> a mass send worldwide, <laughs> just spit it out. Yeah. I, I, one place I used to work for, we had um, all of the printers in the company were on a massive corporate network, and they had offices all around the world, and you could actually like print something out and send it to the the printer own in New York or something yeah, like yeah. their office, <laughs> which was pretty cool. But I guess. Yeah, I mean, you could, you could technically fax something to anyone and have that happen now anyway, I suppose. But it is cool. I remember when I got my first fax modem. Do you remember how futuristic that oh, seemed back God, in the day? Yeah, totally. Well, people are saying, basically, make sure your fax machines are updated. <laughs> you know, there was a bug in the Epson ones recently and a, a, a backdoor risk was discovered. So uh, kind of just... These abandoned devices, you know, maybe plug them into the Ethernet and get an update going on them. <laughs> That's the thing. I mean, you've got to think how many kind of old devices are just lurking in the corners of offices and home offices and bedrooms around the world that are kind of plugged in. People forget about them, but they are still a gateway into your network as well. I, I forget what I have in my own home. Yeah. I've like got a printer and it's got a scanner function and I'm thinking, how am I going to scan this? And it's like, you've got a printer next door. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, because we're in the process of moving house now um, and... I keep looking down the back of my TV 
I mean, probably the last time I had a big clean out of all my cables was maybe about eight years ago. Oh, God. And the stuff down there, I pulled a wire out the other day and I was like, it's not connected to anything. <laughs> what did I just do it lying in there? Yeah. So that's and you've be been plugging, turning that plug on for years every day. <laughs> yeah, it's just lying on the floor and nothing connected to it. So that's always fun. I mean, how many of us have just got stuff plugged in that we've, we've forgotten about? I've got no idea. But again, you know, hackers can take over it. It is always yeah, a way to yeah. network, I suppose. Yeah. So thank you very much for checking out the news in this week's podcast. There will be more next Friday. And now recorded live from Play Expo in London. We love chatting to this guy. Behind the likes of International Karate, Ick Plus, Jimmy White's World Win Snooker, Cue Ball, Archie McLean's Pool. That was a great game as well, wasn't it? Oh, fantastic. And we've got some great stories about Jimmy White in oh, this yeah. one as well. Got to hang around for this. Here he is, recorded at Play Expo London, Archie McLean on the Retro Hour podcast. Please give a warm welcome to Archer. Now, Archer, you've got you know quite a varied history, really. Your childhood was uh, quite varied too. You were in Hong Kong, New Zealand, as well in your school days. What happened there? That, that's uh, because my parents split up, and uh, my dad escaped the UK theoretically to earn enough money to keep us at school. <laughs> so, uh, which is great because I didn't go to school for a whole year. Well, I mean, then was that when you discovered your creative side at that point in your life? Well, the first thing I really massively created that I spent a whole month on uh, was nothing to do with computers or electronics. Who here remembers seeing Tom Baker as Doctor Who? Hey, what was his famous trademark? Scarf. Yeah. So I was like 10, 11 years old, and uh, I didn't have any Meccano, so I traded lots of Conkers at school to acquire a massive amount of Meccano and ended up, after a month and five attempts, of building a machine that knits. Because I tried doing it by hand, because my grand taught me how to do it, and I thought, this is a pain in the ass. So I basically thought, I'll do a machine that does it. And um, it was a one-foot square cube of Meccano. Um, used up every piece I could get out of my friends at school. And yeah, uh, fifth attempt, you turn a handle, wall went in, and out came a knitted scarf. So as a kid, did you kind of start taking household appliances to pieces and um, stuff like that? Yeah, what it was was uh, me and a few mates were at school one day, and we, we threw a telly off a wall. <laughs> in, into uh, a rubbish area and it, it fell apart into lots of pieces and all these colourful little components came out so after we sort of analysed it I thought actually that looks a bit interesting and next day I went back with a pair of household pliers and started pulling all these bits out and I had no idea what a resistor and a capacitor was but, um, but that, that was about 1972 and that was the same year that um, I was at school in Bude in Devon and uh, there's, a, there's a story I've written up in Retrogamer about this. The teacher on a school outing gave me a fiver to go and buy 45 ice creams or something for all the other kids. And I took a shortcut through one of those uh, arcade seafront things. And there was all these mechanical games. And one yellow one, it was called Pong. Now, this is actually mine at home. Because um, 40 odd years later, I thought, I've got to pay homage to what started it all. So I found one of these on eBay. This, this is about 20 years ago when eBay just started. And I bought this from a guy in California, uh, which was an experience because I had to figure out how to fly it over here. Um, and he had it because it was a repossession from someone who hadn't paid a car bill. He ran a garage. And the photographs are all of it in amongst the whole load of cars. So, yeah. Uh, there can't be many of those left in the world, though. I don't know how many, but not many. And this was the first one in Europe that I knew of. And the serial number, if you look at it, is AA0003. Wow. So, possibly one of the very, very earliest ever made. And it just happened to be found in a garage. I okay. mean, even before the arcades became prevalent, I mean, you, you were into electronics because you were actually quite impressed with digital watches as well, weren't you? <laughs> That's opening up a big subject. So, a lot of people forget that, you know, before a lot of these computer companies that went into making computers later on actually made digital watches and calculators before that. But do you remember when you first saw a digital watch? Yeah. Um... When I was 12 or 13, and um, I remember seeing Tomorrow's World with Raymond Baxter, and that was about 73, and he brought out um, an LED watch made by Pulsar, and if you watch James Bond, Live and Let Die, he's got a Pulsar, and it's, a, it's called a P2, and I was mesmerized by that, that watch. You know, where he's, it's magnetic, oh, that's the Rolex, isn't it? And he presses it at 5.48 in the morning, and some young lady gets out of bed that he shouldn't have in there. Um, and I was like, wow, I've got to have one of those. But it was like £500 pounds in 1973. And there's me doing a paper round for £2 a week. <laughs> so anyway, um, as time went on, the price of these watches dropped. And 
I saved up, I think, 20 quid, and I bought myself my first LED watch, which I've still got, and it still works, it still keeps time. And I couldn't really afford much else, but uh, with the advent of eBay 20, 30 years later, and a few bob in the bank from actually being paid for a change by publishers, because they usually don't, um, yeah, I, I sort of went a bit mad. And uh, <laughs> I started collecting calculator watches for some bizarre reason, so there, there's a few calculator watches. The, this one here, this is a HBO one, this is now everyone's favorite watch because of a certain bloke on YouTube called uh, Techmoan. If anyone watches Techmoan. Um, I don't think he bought the last one I sold, but he got a very nice one from somewhere. Well, yeah, I mean, computers, you originally got into them by building your own. I did. How did you discover how to do that then? Uh, necessity. <laughs> okay, the first thing I ever built was in 1974. It was a, a Matchbox radio. I made it out of various bits. And I got it into a radio about this size. Um, and it still works. Well, on AM, but... Okay, um, then in 1978, I had to do a school project, and it was supposed to be something simple, like a two-transistor amplifier. Um, but I went completely nuts and spent a whole year building this thing. Um, this is actually an LED matrix display on one end, oscilloscope. And it's just a little bit more complex than the teacher was expecting. And... Um, Apparently, I got 99% or something, because in those days, you got percentages in the, in the whole of the UK for the O-level. But I failed my English three times, so, you know, I'm pretty crap at languages. <laughs> so, but electronics and programming, a little bit different. So, yeah, that's, that's a bit of a serious project. Um, and I still play around with electronics today. I've, I've got a... This is more modern. I, uh, this is a device I invented a few years ago. Basically, it's a bottle warmer that runs on lithium batteries. And it, it heats up milk and baby stuff as quick as a microwave oven, but on the move. Your house must be like Doc Brown from Back to the Future's house. Yeah, that's what everybody says, except the main bit where I live, which is a normal house. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, that's a bit of electronics. And then the other thing is calculators. Yeah, you're asking just now about how did I get into programming and, and stuff. Uh, yeah, so in about 1975-6, I was following every arcade game that came out. I mean, I, I was addicted. I would hunt down arcade games. I would persuade my granddad to take me to South End on Sea, where there's pier front arcade machines. Um, but they were all 10 pence, and I was a bit crap at them. So, come the advent of personal computers and building them, I actually went and built quite a few NASCOM 1s, Compi kits, and all sorts of other very prehistoric computers. And then, once you've done that, what do you do? So I started writing simple games. And the very first game I ever wrote was called Death Race. And it was a simple black and white driving game um, in 1977. And I sold a few copies to mates on cassette and stuff. We had cassette interfaces in those days before 64, you know. Well, I imagine back then the arcades must have seemed like a magical place. I mean, what was that kind of early arcade atmosphere like uh, going in there as a kid? They weren't on high streets. Uh, there, there was one on Bandits on, in high streets. But if you went to seaside resorts and stuff like that, you would see very early Atari games, uh, Centronic, uh, no, not Centronics. Cin uh, cinematronics and, and very early games from those guys, black and white stuff, vector games, stuff like that. Um, and occasionally, if you went into London, you go up and down Tottenham Court Road, um, around Leicester Square, there was all sorts of arcades around there. And uh, yeah, I used to skive off school and take my, you know, one pound of ten pence pieces and uh, attempt to get as much play as I could. So yeah, I was, I was pretty hooked at an early age, I think. <laughs> well, your first commercial release was Drop Zone, yeah. which was a clone of Defender. How did you get into kind of commercially releasing a game? Um, it, phew, everyone says it's a, it's a clone of Defender, but sideways scrolling shoot 'em ups were what was happening after Scramble, uh, not Scramble, Space Invaders. Um, and then Scramble came out, then Defender. Um, but I, I was a big fan of anything to do with Eugene Jarvis. So, you know, um, Stargate uh, was, uh, was my favorite. Um, Defender was pretty hard as well, and I used to rip the skin off my finger from going up and down, and yeah, I think everyone did that. I've got a Robotron thumb on the other side as well. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, when I left university, my first job was a contract with Atari UK, which is, I thought was a real privilege, because I was such a fan of Atari. And um, so off I went and did some contract work for them, but in the background I was working on what became Drop Zone. And Atari took one look at it and thought, wow, got to have that, because they were looking for uh, a licensed version to put, put out as Defender, the official game. So they looked at Drop Zone and thought, well, you're going to have to convert it. And I thought, yeah, OK, but anyone who's seen the actual Atari 800 cartridge version of Defender that they did put out, it's awful. It runs at about 10 frames a second, and it's actually an Apple game. 
just written in machine code, no, no special effects, no hardware, no nothing. And it's just unplayable. Um, but they did it because, if I'm led to believe rightly, there was a conversation on a golf course and a brown paper bag with some money in it. And it, it was an American side deal. So, yeah, which was a real shame. So, I then had to find a publisher for it, and US Gold came along, and Bob's your uncle. I mean, did Eugene Jarvis know about Drop Zone, or did he, or did he think of it when he eventually uh, found um, out about it? Yeah, I've got a picture of him somewhere, because I do actually know him. Right, this is an article I wrote for um, Retro Gamer about 15 years ago. What this shows is myself and Eugene in America, and we had a game of Robotron whilst talking about games he had on main. <laughs> And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I've got this uh, Drop Zone game. And I, oh, yeah, that's the one I wrote. And he says, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> and he actually said, no, inspiration is not infringement. And I've never forgotten that. Um, yeah, so uh, he, he's a big games player. And he's, he's damn good at Robotron as well. So, and are there all people that consider Drop Zone to be a better game than Defender as well? I've seen that online. <laughs> mainly because I've got infield landscape. So, yeah. Well, so, w what was your kind of favourite system to develop on back then when you were making these there games? There wasn't any. <laughs> no. Um, I wrote Drop Zone on an Atari itself um, with a plug-in cartridge that was an assembler cartridge, but that actually turned out to be really slow. So I ended up using um, an Atari internal macro assembler, um, and I think Drop Zone fitted on four floppies. You know, it was a real nightmare to try and link all four lumps of code. Um, but any utilities and stuff, we didn't know they were called utilities in those days. You just wrote it yourself. You know, whether it's graphics editor, you did a pixel thing in basic. If it's sound, you wrote something in machine code. Um, yeah, it, it, that's the way it was done in the arcades as well. All, all, the, all the same things. And it wasn't until late 80s that someone invented the word tools. And then and people say to me these days, well, so how did you do the AI in IK Plus? Well, it wasn't called anything back then. I just made the men fight each other with varying degrees of skill. And now it's called AI. So... Yeah, we were talking about this on the way down. <laughs> well, getting on to international karate, I mean, how did you hook up with System 3 for that game then? Oh, it was just after I'd finished Drop Zone, and uh, that was doing really well in the charts. And System 3 tracked me down via Zap magazine. They, they, they talked to Gary Penn, I think, the, one of the journalists who reviewed it, and rung me up and uh, promised me the known universe if I would come and do this game that he had or finish it off because one of the other programmers had done a runner. So, I don't know whether John Hare's here. Is he in the audience? He's here tomorrow, but no, yeah, was, was he here. the original programmer then? No, no. Okay. Uh, he was the original artist. Right, okay. And I think someone, we never figured out who, someone did five pages of Z80 code. And that was the problem. It was just diabolical, whatever it was. Uh, and I just took one look and thought, no, but what I can do is rewrite it from scratch and reverse it into the drop zone game shell, take out all the space stuff and put in all the karate stuff and invent all sorts of ways of compressing animation and graphics and stuff. And yeah, that's, that's more or less what happened. But it, it did take um, oh, six months or so. Um, then it went into America and unbeknown to me, it went to number one on the Billboard charts. Uh, and then System 3 kept a little bit quiet about that uh, until someone sent me a copy of Billboard with an arrow saying, what's that? And I went, oh, royalties, <laughs> which I never got. Uh, and of course, System 3 maintained throughout that they never got paid either. But. And then there was a massive legal case because Data East, who produced Karate Champ, came out of the blue and said, Oi, you've copied our game. And their lawyers were saying that I had copied the code, whereas there's no way I copied the code. I mean, uh, there was a lot of karate games back then. There was uh, Exploding Fist on the 64 and stuff, which was brilliant. Absolutely love that game. Um, karate Champ in the arcades, you know, uh, and various other ones. And. Um, I, I just thought, no, I'm going to do a better version of all of them and, and just fill it up with special effects and everything else. But what happened was the, the legal case flattened Epics, the US publisher, and uh, it went on for about two years. And eventually, I was asked to do a statement to the court to justify that it wasn't... I hadn't ripped off someone else's karate code. And all I said in, in a statement was that yeah, it's a karate game with karate moves, with karate uniforms, karate sound effects, karate everything, and you can't copyright karate. Um, and it doesn't look like karate champ, so what's the problem? And eventually the Supreme Court in America said, yep, that's, we'll, we'll accept that, and we'll invent a whole new bunch of laws called look and feel laws, and uh, because of World Karate Championship, otherwise known as IK1. So it's all my fault. <laughs> well, that's what I've been told anyway. <laughs>
Well, karate was huge then, wasn't it, with Karate Kid? Mid-80s. Wow, everything. I mean, fists sold, I don't know, millions and millions. Um, and I remember playing that until the sun came up and broke joysticks and all sorts. So, and my mate Barry has never forgiven me for that, Just keeping him up all night. Hours and hours and hours on it. Trying to get that ball to run across the screen. Do you remember all that? Yeah. <laughs> well, I remember International Karate on the Commodore 64. That soundtrack by Rob Hubbard. I mean, that was like nothing else I'd ever heard at the time. I mean, were you, were you really impressed with Rob's work on it? Well, IK1 was, whilst I did all the code, Rob did all the music, uh, I did all the sound effects. Um, but Mark Kell, System 3, basically uh, was fairly adamant that we would have something that sounded like Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence. Uh, uh, well, is that the yeah. David Bowie thing? I've uh, forgotten the name of it. Um, so Rob said, OK, well, that's not infringement. <laughs> Let's make something similar and re-expressed it, and uh, yeah, the music's addictive. I mean, I I've actually got, this is our sad arm, I've got that on a memory stick in the car, <laughs> along with a lot of other game stuff, so yeah. But the sound effects as well, they were awesome. Like, how did you improve then on International Karate with International Karate Plus? Well, obviously, uh, the, the key thing with IK Plus is the third player. And the reason that came about is because at the time, um, there were other karate games where they would show a backdrop of, of a dojo with half a dozen players waiting on the side to come out and fight you. Um, and I, I had this idea that I wanted each player to get up when it was his turn and walk onto the, the main fighting area and the other one to go back. So I was mucking around with various ideas for that. And then I thought, hang on a minute, I've got enough sprites and characters here to actually do a third fighter. So I had all these... It was a nightmare because I used all the sprites on two of the players and the third player is actually character block bitmaps. Um, but then, depending on who's winning, they're in front or behind of the others. So, yeah, it, it was a nightmare. But the, uh, the sound effects, everyone asked me how to do the sound effects. Now, half of them uh, I did do myself by running around the house and hitting things with wooden spoons and going, Wah! you know, and this sort of thing. And then editing it with uh, a machine code editor. But there were a couple that came, and I fully admit this, out of uh, Into the Dragon. Because I wrote to Warner Brothers, who owned the IPR for that film, and they eventually wrote back and said, if it's less than four seconds sample, there's nothing we can do about it, and uh, good luck. And I've still got that letter, just in case. <laughs> but a lot of games about then did just sample anything, though, didn't yeah. they? Well, it was they, like the games industry was a bit like the Wild West, I guess. They were sampling each other. <laughs> yes. What, what about those different fighting sections as well? Because they had, uh, I remember, defending things coming at you with a shield from different <laughs> angles, and that really kind of split up the gameplay, which was really um, good. Yeah, there, there was the deflecting bombs, bouncing bombs, and then there was the bombs that would bounce on, and you had to kick them off. But the, the trouble was, I only had so much memory, and I wanted to have loads of levels, but I just ran out of memory. So there's only two levels. But the, the, the one, uh, the, the funnest one, is where you're moving the arm up and down, trying to knock the bouncing balls off. Now that, fun enough, was inspired by a Game & Watch game in 1980 called Manhole. Um, but it, it involves trying to make a bridge appear on six positions on the screen, and it just gets faster and faster. And I found it really addictive. So it seemed natural to try and mimic the same addiction by having the karate guy moving the shield up and down. So that's, that's where that came from. In IK Plus, there was a lot of Easter eggs in that game, I read. Like, <laughs> the about 40, 45, mm, was there or more? Uh, there, there was an article in Retro Camera about this, because I, I unveiled a few. Uh, yeah, there, there's actually more. There's 60 or 70, but I've, I've forgotten them all. Um, there's, there's daft ones, like if you type in germ, G-E-R-M, uh, all the language goes into German because one of my mates was German. His name was Axel. He ended up in the EU, God bless him. Uh, um, as in within the Brussels. <laughs> so yeah, um, he converted the whole game into German. But um, no, there was all sorts of dodgy ones. You know, swear words and stuff would actually reset the game. Um, and there was lots of messages to mates and stuff and uh, things that speeded it up, things that slowed it down, things that changed the angle of the slant of the shadows at the bottom of the screen. If you do a bit of Googling, you'll find those things. You, you published it in Retro uh, Gaming. I have had a look a couple of times, but the, 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 the article for IK Plus is out there somewhere, but there's numerous websites that are like fan sites for IK Plus, and uh, they seem to have hacked the game and found them out. <laughs> well, Jimmy White's uh, Whirlwind Snooker was uh. a total revolutionary game. I remember seeing it on Games Master back in the days with uh, you on it. As well. <laughs> yeah, it was the last game I ever produced on my own without a publisher interfering it, with it, because they normally try and you know, double the cost by interfering and everything takes twice as long. So as a result, we had three months of uh, PR with no development. So 
what happened with uh, that game, it was originally called 147, and there was a wonderful animated screen that looks a little bit like IK+, with little dots flying around everywhere. And um, we were showing it off in June 91, three months before it was released, and it was on the Virgin stand, and a certain Mr. Jeremy Beadle, Mr. Jeremy Beadle, who was doing all those TV programs at the time, he walked out of nowhere and said, that game plays like Jimmy White to one of the Virgin guys who fortuitously said, oh, do you know him? And, um, you know, I sort of came over and said, yeah, do you know him? Have you got his number? And he said, yeah. So he whipped out his phone and um, had a number for Barry Hearn, who was Jimmy's agent. And 48 hours later, we went over to Romford and met Jimmy, met Barry Hearn. And within about half an hour, it was like, yeah, we'll give you loads of money. <laughs> and sign here, son, you know, and that was it. So without Jeremy Beadle, Jimmy White wouldn't have been involved. It, it may not have happened. Yeah, well, it, it, we, we looked at um, uh, Stephen Hendry, um, but um, th the publisher thought he was a bit too mechanical, whereas Jimmy White does have a quite a wild gameplay. And if you look at the game, J Jimmy White does actually play a pretty wild game. So, yeah, it, it, was ju it was just one of those moments in life where you thought, wow, what a good luck chance that was. <laughs> Well, obviously, then you had to promote the game with Jimmy, which I imagine was uh, quite interesting. Mm -hmm. I know, but then you were on Motormouth doing yeah. an interview, and he wasn't there. It was just um, you. What happened there? Does anyone remember seeing Motormouth in 1991? Okay, well, it is on YouTube if you want to go and have a look. Um, yeah, what happened there was um, this was Virgin's first massive, big, live expose to the world of um, Jimmy White Snooker. Yeah, we had to get there the Friday night for a, a rehearsal at seven in the morning. And the, it was going out live at about quarter past nine, something like that. Anyway, um, the, the, the problem was, uh, Jimmy didn't turn up on the Friday night to have a, a pie and a pint. So that was a bit of a nuisance. So six o'clock on the Saturday morning, the producer is ringing Jimmy's house and his wife's answering. And then they sent a taxi round and uh, she answered the door and said, yeah, uh, he's uh, just getting up. And that was about 6.30. Uh, and then the taxi driver knocks on the door again about 10 minutes later, and she says, uh, he's just having a shave. And uh, another 10 minutes later, he's just having his flakes. And he went on like this for about an hour, one excuse after another, and he didn't materialize. Um, and then after about another hour, uh, when there was virtually no chance of getting into the studio, and they were talking about helicopters and stuff, he, she eventually comes to the door on a Saturday morning and said, I'm terribly sorry, but he's not here. He's, he went out for a drink on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> and this was Saturday morning? This was Saturday morning, and he really had gone out for a drink and disappeared. And, uh, th yeah, what happened then was they were talking about pulling the, the slot, but they didn't have anything else to put in it. So I'm in the studio, dressed up in my snooker gear, um, begging for this thing not to be pulled. And Andy Crane was there, and he said, I'll tell you what, I'll put Jimmy's gear on, which was too big for him, it's too baggy, and I'll try and play snooker, and he can't. But nonetheless, it made for good footage, and it was completely live, unscripted, unrehearsed, and went well. And I think I walked off stage and collapsed. <laughs> so. But there's also a story about Richard Branson as well, and, oh. and Jimmy White there. Oh, there, well, there was loads, loads, yeah, yeah, there's loads of stuff about that. Um, I need to get this video out there, because um, one of the four extra days he gave us was... Um, to do some filming for a Channel 4 company called, a program called 6.30 something. And it was a news broadcast that went out 6.30 about stuff in the media. And uh, yeah, Virgin uh, said, well, this game's doing rather well. They were, the day one ship out was tens of hundreds of thousands, whatever it was. And um, Branson himself said, oh yeah, I'll do half hour. So pff, result, you know. So I had to, to ensure Jimmy was gonna turn up, I had to go and collect him and then drive through South London to get to Branson's house, which was a nightmare. Um, but halfway through London, Jimmy says, oh, there's a pub, I own it. And I thought, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so he stops and had a swift six points. <laughs> and I, I had just a half, uh, I only had half of that, I only drunk half of it. Yeah, uh, it, was, it was water blessed by a saint because I was driving, honest. Uh, anyway, we then had, this is before sat now, we then had a nightmare finding Branson's house, but we eventually got there. And we go in, and the first thing Branson does is, uh, hello chaps, have a gin and tonic. And he empties half a bottle into a huge glass, and uh, that finished me off, and definitely finished Jimmy off. Anyway, what happened was, um, the TV crew turned up, we went upstairs, there's a big snooker room he's got, and a magnificent table. 
and um, they, they started filming the bit. Now, there's two things that happened. One was that, this was 91, no one had ever seen icons before. This is before Windows sort of thing. So the Amiga, the version that was playing, was on a table with a monitor behind it and Jimmy and Branson, and neither of them have ever used a mouse before. So how are we going to film them playing the game? So on the footage, there's two pairs of hands belonging to Jimmy and Branson, and I'm underneath the table with a hand like this, looking at a monitor under the table, trying to control the game, whilst Branson's going, yeah, yeah, see, I'll, I'll just put a bit of chalk on, like, you know. So, yeah, uh, anyway, the, the, the funniest bit was, with all the gin and tonics flowing and the six pints earlier, um, Jimmy is trying to play around with Branson, and he just can't get a ball in. It, there's no chance. It, the ball misses the pocket by miles, and Branson sort of says, we're paying you loads of money, and you're crap at snooker. I mean, the actual game itself had a lot of personality, too. I remember, you know, when you played the game, if you took a bit too long on one of the shots, the balls would start making faces at you, and flies would start landing on the table. I mean, how well, did you come up with those kind of ideas? Uh, that's the first one. Well, I always wanted to do games that had endearment, and games that didn't just go static. Because at the time, a lot of games, if you didn't play them, they were just static. So, what's the point? So I used to wait, I had a little timer running in the background, and you know, after 30 seconds or so, the balls would start pulling faces and what have you. So, uh, got, yeah, something like that, uh, along with sort of, you know, sound effects. So, yeah, um, and then there were flies that would walk all over the screen, uh, and that was inspired because working at night in the countryside, in the middle of summer, little flies would turn up uh, and walk all over the screen, and it used to annoy the hell out of me. And then I thought, oh, I can mimic that. And I think I did a pretty good mimic of these flies because Virgin got loads and loads of phone calls, their customer service, saying, I've got a virus version, or there's an error, uh, you know. <laughs> but you would play the game late at night in the summer, yeah? Yes. You, would, you would think, hit your screen I, like that. I, 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 I used it to up. write uh, code at three in the morning, because uh, in those days, it was before YouTube, before phone calls, before mobile phones. I just used to be able to concentrate. So I used to sleep at day and uh, work at night, which is why I'm white. <laughs> but, I mean, it was logical to do a pool game afterwards, and uh, you were the headline on the, on the pool game. Yeah, because they were hoping to sell Virgin, they were hoping to sell a lot of those in America, and who, who the hell knows me in America? Uh, so they approached um, Paul Newman for, because of the film Colour of Money, if I remember rightly, and he said, no chance, not interested in games. Jimmy wasn't known, um, and just calling it Paul wasn't any good. So uh, they trademarked my name and then put it on there anyway. So, yeah, well, I didn't mind, but you know, it was all to do with the trademark, to be honest. Yeah, so I was saying, with your later games, you kind of got into proper 3D rendering with some of the uh, balls. Was it kind of basically better to uh, use 3D, or was it? Well, there's a little bit of an admission with this because the underlying snooker code was exactly the same as Jimmy White's one. And uh, don't tell Virgin that. Oh, damn. <laughs> um, and what we actually did was add 99% of extra hard work for the, all the rendering, the modeling, and everything else. So did it add much to the game? Maybe. But was it worth the hassle and the time and the money and everything else? Not so sure. And the, the hands, uh, those animated gloves, were a huge, huge challenge. They're motion-captured fingers. We bought these in America, and they were like uh, 10,000 pounds, courtesy of Virgin. And they measure all the individual movements of your fingers using resistive sensors that flex. Um, so, yeah. It looked very realistic, though. Well, yes, because it's my hands. Yeah. I had a good result. <laughs> the, the only thing is I can't actually really play snooker. But I can do sort of, you know... <laughs> You can mime it. Yeah, it, 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 we, we tidied it up in post. <laughs> I said, you know, the, the stuff that you did have in that game, though, there was even, like, bonus games in there. Wasn't the drop zone in that game? Uh, there was. I'm not sure I got photographs of it. We had a fully playable checkers game. Um, the game was originally called Q because of a ball with a Q pointing into it, so we left the logo in. Um, random pictures of Jimmy all over the pool room. Oh, right. This is a secret Tom and Jerry mouse room, which I don't think anyone's ever found. But once you go in there and look around, uh, it unlocks all sorts of cheats in the game. So it is in there. It's behind the clock in the corner if anyone ever wants to play it again. There it is, through the mouse hole. And as far as you know, no one's found that? We didn't get any letters about it, because right. usually you did. Uh, there was, uh, hang on, that's the pool room. Drop zone's in that um, cocktail table on the left. So but were you involved with the port side, the Dreamcast oh, version as well? There's a hidden button. <laughs> were, we, were you involved in like the Dreamcast port and like yeah, two of the yeah, systems? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. 
were they interesting to do, like the, the consoles of the time? Um, Dreamcast was a nightmare because it only had 16 megabytes in it. Um, but 12 megabytes of it was taken up by WinCE, which sat there and did absolutely nothing. So we had a lot of stuff streaming off the, the CD drive, whatever it was in that. So yeah, nightmare. I could sit here all day and talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, is there any questions for Archer? Um, you've also got plenty of um, videos, photographs, development documents. Any plans to release those as a book or an archive of some sort? Uh, well, at the moment, I'm not actually doing game stuff. Uh, believe it or not, I'm uh, tied up with renewable energy. Uh, and I've gone back to my electronics roots. Um, but having said that, there, there is uh, various things afoot to do something with IK++. Um, possibly Mercury, actually, and possibly uh, drop zone. There's all sorts of things that may happen soon, because I've spent the past eight years playing around with electronics. So. <laughs> Any other questions? What do you attribute to your success and longevity in the game industry? Uh, well, I would say about 70% of the contracts I've ever signed have always resulted in a legal case to get paid. So uh, I think the percentage for other people was about 95%, where they just die after their first game. So, um, but no, I'm persistent, tenacious, and love games. You know, that's ever since I was playing Pong as a 10 year old, that's uh, what I've always wanted to do. Um, but these days, you know, the, uh, the game budgets are tens of millions or even 100 million in a couple of cases, and massive teams, huge efforts. Big publishers, licenses for everything, two, three years, by which time the platforms disappeared and something else has come along. So, yeah, there, there's major challenges compared to when I was doing it, which was typically six months a year, 18 months or whatever. Um, and uh, d doing them on my own was so much more fun because it's just me to do my own thing. And uh, when you start running a large company, I mean, Mercury got up to 50, 60 people on the whole team, on the whole company. And, uh, yeah, that was quite a nightmare. But we had a really good team and we produced a great product. So... Hmm. Have a question there as well? Yeah, it's just a silly question about the T button on the, on the game IK+. Plus. Uh, what, what inspired it? Uh, you know the T button? Oh, uh, the trousers. Yeah. Uh, th that just stemmed from... Um, if, has anyone here seen Cannonball Run, the first one, where Jackie Chan is having a fight scene with loads of bikers and stuff? And th there's a, a fight scene where he does a double head kick and knocks out two people at once. And it was the animation for that that I used a sort of a rotoscoping technique to actually put into the game. But later on in the film, he's having a fight with someone and someone kicks him and his trousers drop down. And he goes, ooh, you know. So I thought, ah, that's a good thing to put in a game. Why not? So yeah, and that's basically where it came from. But uh, look online, there's, there's 50 other, 60 other cheats that do other things. <laughs> well, it's one more from me. Are you still in touch with Jimmy White? Yeah. Um, <laughs> He rang up not so long ago um, from the car. He was driving up the M40 and ran out of petrol. So uh, he wanted to know where the nearest petrol station was. So I said, what you need is an electric car because you know, I'm into Teslas these days. And he said, what's one of them? And um, he, uh, he needs to go in yours. <laughs> we'll sell him on the future. So yeah, that, that sort of randomly happens. And uh, yeah, he keeps in touch. I mean, I went to his birthday party yeah, and what it was, was uh, he had a birthday celebration in the Dorchester and he and Ronnie Sullivan got together to do a championship match and Ronnie actually beat him. I think Jimmy had had a few points again. Um, now, what was interesting was uh, there was a lot of royalty from the snooker business there, but um, the band playing in the background was the Rolling Stones, who I'd never seen live myself, so that was a bit of a turn up. Quite a showbiz do then. Yeah, but when we all sat down to have dinner, I sat next to Michael Jackson. No way. No way. <laughs> but that's not the real Michael Jackson. <laughs> I was going to say, what, what year was this? But th this was actually after the real Michael Jackson had, right, had okay. uh, headed north. So this guy was extremely convincing. <laughs> and I, I, was, I, I was doing a double take saying, you've just faked your death. You're, you're like a Howard Hughes or an Elvis or something, and you're really still alive. But uh, he even spoke the same. <laughs> that, that was a weird night, a very weird night. Anyway, everyone got completely smashed, and I can't even remember how I got out. So. Did Jimmy want to give you a phone call and ask you if, if he could re-release Jimmy White's World Wind Snooker on the Wii or something for his daughter, I, I read once. But he was asking if that was possible. Um, there were was, there was some discussions on uh, how quickly things could be converted. But the funniest thing was, uh, back in 91, I remember... I think he's got five kids, and one of them had been born on the day that we were doing the Branson thing. 
um, which was a bit tricky because he was supposed to be changing nappies as well as doing this PR. And that, that girl, her name's Breeze, I think, uh, as in wind, um, he rang up not so long ago and saying, uh, if you're still running a games company, can she have a job as a graphics artist? And I'm going, hang on a minute, I remember seeing you Starkers once when you were having your nappy changed. <laughs> it was a bit, bit, bit of a weird sort of memory, but uh, unfortunately I wasn't running a team at, the, at that time, and I'm not, I'm not sure where she ended up, but she wanted to be in the games industry. So there you go. Archer, it's been one, we could talk to you all night, but I know the Oliver Twins are itching to get on the stage. Thank you so much for sharing your stories with us. Please give a big thank you to Archer McLean. Thank you.